do a test and the teacher comes and says, when you're done with that, here's another test. <laughs> and we're like, oh, are you kidding me? I haven't even finished this test. And then you're just about finished with the second one and the teacher says, now here's an essay test. <laughs> and not even multiple choice. Yeah. You know, you got... You got 25% chance on multiple choice to get the question right. If it's true false, you got 50% chance. If it's an essay, you're sunk, unless you know the material. There's an examination going on in our life all the time. People are examining us. Institutions are examining us, like the IRS. I just got a bill from the IRS yesterday for a tax bill that I paid three weeks ago. <laughs> That's a test. Everybody's examining everything. And you know what happens when we examine someone and we use our standard of measure to examine someone else. We use an imperfect system to examine someone else. We kind of talked about that this morning in Coffee Talk, where, uh, where sometimes we measure people by our own standards instead of by the standard of the word. And the first rule in measuring anything by the standard of the word is we have to measure ourselves first. Because once I measure myself by the word, I'm no longer going to be concerned about measuring somebody else. It's not that it never happens. There are places where he does let us judge someone's fruit and all that stuff. But the first thing that has to happen is, by our own standard of measure, we are measured. So if we measure by this standard... It fixes us, and then all of a sudden we're like, yeah, I don't, need to, I don't need to measure somebody else. I think I'll just let the word do that. I think I'll just worry about myself. We, uh, Cheryl and I worked in a home for developmentally disabled people when we first met. Well, not when, when we first started dating. We'd met years ago. We met when I was 12 and she was five. I would have gotten arrested had we dated at that time <laughs> and should have. But uh, anyway, so uh, we were working in this home and Lynn was this really, really cool guy. Um, he had a, a lot of developmental disabilities, but uh, had really, really sweet personality. And uh, he, uh, he had a smoking habit. And so he would sit there, he'd light a cigarette and then he'd sit there and he would never smoke it. And it would just... <laughs> It would just ash out, and he'd have the cigarette, and the ash would be this long. And so Cheryl one time said to him, Lynn, uh, flick your cigarette, get that ash off there. And he said, just worry about yourself, don't worry about me. <laughs> She's like, okay. Because, you know, in our, in our manual, there was nothing about, you know, making sure someone ashed their cigarette. And so it was like, you know what, on a scale of, of importance, I guess ashing your cigarette just really isn't in there. Uh, and so, but I, I just remember, and we joke about this all the time. She'll say, hey, would you do this? And I'll say, hey, you worry about yourself. Don't worry about me. But we've really developed that as a lifestyle, as a church. We say, hey, don't you dare examine me. You got issues in your life, so you can't examine me. And we get this idea that, um, life is about living ourselves as, uh, as individuals and we're not accountable to anybody. And, uh, you know, Paul kind of addressed that when he said, uh, he said, I don't even examine myself. Because when I examine myself, he said, I come to realize the things I want to do, I don't do, and the things I don't want to do, I do do. So what he was saying is, when I examine myself, I'm going to justify my behavior. Right? I'm not really going to get to the root of my issues. You know where I'm going with this, right? If you want to examine yourself, 
You need to open yourself to be examined by the Lord, by the Word. And if we will let the Word examine us, we're going to get a clear picture of our issues. And as Cheryl says, my issue, or your issue is you. Your issue is you. Say that three times fast. Your issue is you. In saying that, I have to know my issue is me. My issue isn't what somebody did to me. I was wrong, so that's why I acted out. My issue is I acted out. I made some mistakes. I chose to act in a way that doesn't line up with my character and my integrity and certainly not my identity in Jesus. Examination is crucial to the lifestyle we have as a believer. Examination is crucial. But it's not us examining ourselves or us examining each other. Is are we willing to open our lives and our soul to the one who prepared a way to be redeemed from all of the issues? Are we willing to do that? Are you willing to do that? Am I willing to do that? Am I willing to say, you know what, there's some things that happened this week that could like really set us off course. Are we willing to say, well, it was so-and-so's fault, so I'm good, I don't need to change. Or are we willing to look at things and say, is there anything I did to contribute to that? Lord, is there anything in my heart that might have... Uh, put grease on the wheels so this thing happened? Is there anything that I'm harboring in my soul that needs to just be exposed to the light? Is there anything I need to repent of? Is there anything I need to confess before you, Lord? See, we have this idea that repentance is a one-time event in our lives. Oh, just say a prayer at the end of a service and boom, you're good. Well, first of all, entering the kingdom doesn't happen by you saying a prayer. Uh-oh. Now I'm dealing with some doctrine and theology, right? Jesus said, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. He said the way into the kingdom is through repentance. We confess. That word confess means to agree with. So we confess to God our sins. We agree with God that we're sinful. And then repentance is the word metanoia, which means change of mind. And so we confess our sins. We agree with God that we're sinful. Then we come to this point where we repent and we change our mind about that issue. If someone tells you they're going to do something and they don't do it, they lied. If I tell you I'm going to swing by your house on Thursday and we're going to pick up that load of wood and I'll take it to the neighbor's house for you. And then I don't show up on Thursday. I've lied. Right? I need to confess that before God. I need to agree with God that that was a sinful act. And then I need to change my mind about how I behave and how I think and how I act. The next thing I'm going to do, I'm going to clear that up with God. The next thing I'm going to do, I'm going to clear that up with him. I blew you off. I just wanted to go fishing on Thursday, and I'm sorry for that. I should have done what you asked me and then taken you fishing with me. If I were to examine myself on that issue, I would say, oh, my. Mike, you haven't had a day off in a long time, and you really need some time. Just, just go fishing. Just spend some time with God. Ray will understand. See, my examination of myself, I'm going to make excuses for myself. And the, way I, the reason I know that is because Isaiah 
5.20 says that our souls are selfish and fleshly. And that if we examine ourselves, we're going to leave things out. In fact, what we're going to do is we're going to call evil good and we're going to call good evil. I got a little sin in my life, but I'm not as bad as Cheryl. And all of a sudden, I'll begin to justify something in my life that blocks my access with God. I'm not saying that your sin uh, banishes you from the kingdom. I'm not saying you lose your salvation. Uh, that's, that's a secondary issue to having access to God, to having pure fellowship with God. I want to talk to you today about confession and repentance, and I've subtitled it, The Lost Art of Fellowship with God. We think fellowship with God is put on a, a cool worship CD or Spotify or whatever. And then, boom, just feel better about myself. And then just start proclaiming the word and everything's good. I feel so good. Well, I'm just going to tell you what. All it takes is one person to make you mad and that changes the way you feel. Right? Right? Tony Evans said that he told his son one day, take out the garbage. And his son said, Dad, I don't feel like taking out the garbage. And Tony said, son, I can change the way you feel. <laughs> and, you know, that's the way God is. God's like, you're like, God, I, I just don't feel like going to church today. I stayed up late and watched Saturday Night Live, which probably was a sin in itself. Just kidding. Just joking. Well, I'm not joking. I made choices and then justified behavior that's outside of my character and integrity and said, well, I was just tired this morning. You're tired because you chose to do something that you knew would lead to you not coming to church. And I'm not saying not coming to church is a sin. Although the Bible says don't forsake together, don't forsake the assembling together of the saints. So if it becomes a habit, it's an issue. Remember, your issue is you. And my issue is me. <clears throat> and he doesn't have any issues. That's why we use him to examine us. Because he's light. He's pure. There's no darkness in him. And so we're going to use light. We're going to use holy God to examine us so we can expose everything in our life. Doesn't mean we're going to become perfect every single time. Life's a journey. Christianity is a journey. This walk with Christ means we're going to stumble. We're going to go one step forward, one step back. Two steps forward, one step back. Five steps forward, 27 steps back. Sometimes it is that way, isn't it? The Bible says when a righteous man falls, he gets back up. If he falls seven times, it infers that he gets back up seven times. We've got to lay our entire soul before God. He will allow us to see our faults. He's not going to hide anything from us. And we want that. We should want that. We should not choose to be examined by somebody who will give us grace all the time. Do you know it does not do anybody any good if you constantly just give them grace and never hold them accountable? Right? We have to have some accountability in this thing. But we first have to have accountability to God. See, if we won't be accountable to God, we won't be accountable to each other. We'll lie to each other. We really will. But if we will learn to be accountable to him, fellowship can happen. First Corinthians 4, 5 says, Therefore judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of our heart. If we truly have a relationship, we really want that. 
I, I, I just, I can't even count the number of people that have told me their life story and they said, I got to a point in my life where I was doing so much bad stuff, I just wanted to get caught. I just wanted to get caught and thrown into jail because I knew at that point I'd have to change. That, I'm telling you that, just knowing that tells you they know what they're doing is wrong. And, and I'll tell you what, you first have to acknowledge that you know what you're doing is wrong. That's the confession part. We'll get to the repentance part in just a second. But we've got to acknowledge, I am not perfect. I don't know everything. As the spiritual leader of the church, I'm going to tell you, if this shocks you, I'm sorry, I'm not perfect. He's not. And neither is Cheryl <laughs> or Ray. In fact, let me tell you some stories. No, I'm just kidding. We've got to let God reveal the deeper, darker areas in our life that need exposed. We need full exposure. You know why we need full exposure? Because once we confess to God and we agree with him about where we're at in this walk, then he gives us an opportunity to change our minds. The biblical word in the New Testament is metanoia. I, I, I'll, I'll tell you, there's three words and they're all uh, they all have that same root word. But I'm just going to tell you, metanoia means a change of mind. And here's the key thing. You don't have to do the work. You just have to choose to have a changed mind. And then 1 Corinthians 2.16, Paul says, but we have the mind of Christ. See, 2 Corinthians 10.5, this one I don't think is up there yet. 2 Corinthians 10.5 says um, that, that um, we uh, take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. You can't do that with your own mind. Like I said, you'll justify your sin. But if we have the mind of Christ, then when we take thoughts captive, it doesn't, take, it doesn't say take every bad thought captive, it says take every thought captive. So even when we think something is good, we still have to have it examined. There's a lot of good stuff we could do today. There's an event over here. There's an event over there. There's an event here. There's an event there. There's all this stuff here. It doesn't mean that we should be led to do everything. It means, you know what? That might be a good thing, but God may want me over here. I'm pretty sure today he wants me in my recliner. But he could change my mind about that. I have this special recliner. No, I'm just kidding. And so uh, the, the key to this thing is, is that <clears throat> when we will let God be our examiner, he's examining us for a purpose. It's not to tell us what's wrong with ourselves. That's part of the process. But the purpose of the examination is to get us an A+. Plus. He's not examining us to show us our failure. He's examining us to show us what needs to change so when we can become an A student. Now, I'm not saying God has report cards and you know what I'm not. I'm just using that as an example. His goal is to make us successful in this journey. His goal is not to point out our faults so we can say, condemnation, you're bad, you'll never amount to anything, you wretched sinner. His goal is to say, listen, according to Ephesians 1.4, I predestined you to be holy and blameless in my sight. So this examination is to get you closer to my image. Genesis 1.26 and 7. He created us in his image so that we would look and act like him. Purpose of the examination, get us to look and act like him. Stop acting like the little brat you are or I am. Start acting like the father. That's why all who are led by the spirit are sons of God. 
Another place he talks about sons and daughters of God. We each have this father relationship with God where he's saying, I'm just trying to raise you right. Right? Raise a child in the way he should go. When he's old, he shall not uh, depart from it. That's God's job to us. That's just not a good proverb from Solomon. He kind of failed a little bit along the way if you look at the end of his life because he stopped letting God examine him and he started letting these foreign wives bring in idols to his, to his house and then to the temple. He stopped the examination process when he needed it the most. John 16, 8 says that the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. He never condemns us. He doesn't show us what's wrong and then say, you bad. He doesn't do that. The Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. In other words, he shows us what's wrong. And then he convicts us of righteousness. He shows us what's right. And then he convicts us of judgment. What's that mean? That means that he shows us what isn't right and he shows us where it could lead us. So he puts us on the path to do what's right. Because we know where that's going to lead us. It's going to lead us to fellowship with God and ultimately that reward where we rule and reign with him in the new heaven and the new earth. In relationship and intimacy with God, we will one day become to love this process of examination. You really will. I'm just telling you, we fight it because of our flesh. But once we get through this initial, we go, oh my goodness, fellowship with him is so sweet and so wonderful. And we begin to crave it. We begin to crave the cleansing, the healing, the absolution. The next step in the process of intimacy, once we confess, we agree with God, we're sinful. Then we repent, we change our mind, we put on the mind of Christ. The next thing that happens is, Psalm 103.12 says, as far as the east is from the west, that's how far God removes our transgressions from us. And Hebrews 10.17, he says, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. The cleansing process is a process we go through. So when God looks at us, he says, I don't remember your sin. In fact, uh, in Isaiah chapter 44, God says, I removed your transgressions for my sake. That's how bad he wants fellowship with us. Is that he sent Jesus to die for us for his own sake. We think it's all about us. That narcissism. Oh, life revolves around me. God says, I've removed your transgression so I can have fellowship with you. So I can have this relationship with you. So you will look at the light that I I shine on you and you will walk out of darkness and walk into that light. Romans 6.11, Paul says we are are to be dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. That's this beautiful process. Confession and repentance makes us alive to God in Christ Jesus. Again, uh, uh, Ephesians 1.4 says that he, sent, that he predestined Jesus before the foundation of the world so that we would be holy and blameless in his sight. Jesus came to show us God the Father and then to take up his cross, to be crucified, to die, to be buried, and on the third day, he's resurrected, thereby defeating our sin. He's defeated death. He's defeated the authority of the enemy in our lives, all of that stuff. He has finished everything that we need to live in fellowship with God. He 
He wants to make us dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. This is called justification. He justifies us. The easiest way to remember what that means is that when we submit to this process, it's just as if we had never sinned. When God looks at us, he does not see addict, alcoholic, criminal, felon. He sees son, daughter. That's what he sees. When the prodigal son finally figured out he didn't know everything, he ran back to the father. And the Bible says the father ran to him and said, you worthless scum. (laughs) Oh, no, that's not what it says, is it? He ran to him. He put a ring on his finger. He put a robe on him. And he said, kill the calf. We're going to have a feast. He forgot everything sinful in that son's life. And he said, the one who is lost has come back. God does that every single time we confess and repent. He restores that fellowship. It's beautiful. Do you know why we have to change our minds? You know why we have to repent and change our minds? You know why we have to put on the mind of Christ? Because we'll remember our sin. And we'll live in condemnation even though God's forgiven us. And I'm telling you, almost every counseling session I have with people, not every, but almost every one, is people that feel condemned because of their past sin. And they can't understand the forgiveness and the forgetfulness of God. He's not forgetful because he has Alzheimer's. He chooses to forget our sin because he loves us that much. Finally, this process leads to a beautiful verse. I was studying this a couple of weeks ago, and when I really felt led to talk about confession and repentance, I went back to this verse and said, it's all right here in Psalm 119, 59. Beautiful verse of scripture. David says this, I thought about my ways and turned my steps back to your decrees or your word. David said, I thought about my ways and turned my steps back to your word. There are three words for repentance in the New Testament. When David says, I thought about my ways, that describes this first Greek word, uh, metamelomachi. I know it's it's a mouthful. It means a change of mind that produces regret or remorse, but not necessarily a change of heart. So when we see our sin, sometimes we're like, oh, I'm really sorry for that. But there's not really a change in our heart yet. It means we're we're thinking about this thing, and and I'm like, I kind of like to change my heart on this thing, but whether you just think I don't know how to do it, or maybe there's something that goes, but I kind of like my sin, I'm kind of comfortable with where I'm at. In the flesh, I thought about my ways. That's like this process of breakthrough. Everybody's like, oh, we need breakthrough, we need breakthrough, we need breakthrough. Breakthrough is foolishness, unless you have follow through. You got to do something with breakthrough. You say to somebody, wow, thanks for that sermon. Man, I really got some breakthrough on that. You tell me that, and I'm going to say, what's your follow through plan? People go, uh, uh, bleh, 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 what? I said, is it, are you going to change? Because just telling me you got breakthrough doesn't mean a thing. He says, David says, I thought about my ways. Then he says, and turn my steps back. That word, metanoieo, is a changing of mind and purpose as the result of knowledge. In other words, I change my behavior and my actions as a complete process of repentance. That's where we get to this point where we see our sin and we say, I don't want to do that no more. So I see that it's wrong, 
And I have an unction in me to stop doing that which is wrong. I have a, 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 a friend in ministry years ago. He got into some issues and had a huge fall. The entire nation knew about his fall. And it's funny because he's the guy that taught me this one thing that could have saved him. He's the guy that taught me. When people come to me and they say, man, I just, I'm struggling with this particular sin. He says, I tell them, well, stop it. They're like, what? Stop struggling with it? No, just stop the sin. And they're like, I never thought of that. (laughs) Yeah. This type of repentance is I'm changing my mind and I'm going to let it change my behavior. I'm going to let my mind change so it changes my heart. Now, you do know that the heart the Bible talks about is not your physical muscle heart. Okay, it's up here too. So when you change your mind, changing your heart means I'm going to do what I'm thinking about. Okay? Now, I will tell you this. Sin will affect your muscle heart, but at first the sex affects... (laughs) It first affects your inner man heart. That inner man heart is that thinking process that leads to your behavior. And that's the important part. Now, here's how he finished it. He said, I thought about my ways. So I'm thinking about coming in line with you, God. Then I turned my steps back to you. Then I agreed, hey, this is a good idea. I need to change my behavior. He says, then I turned my steps back to your decrees or to your word, to your principles. This is where he said, now I'm going to walk it out. This is the follow through to the breakthrough. The breakthrough says, I recognize it. I even want it. But the follow through says, now I'm going to walk it out. So my tendency to kick the dog when I'm mad, I not only recognize it's not fair to the dog to kick him because I'm mad, But I'm actually going to stop doing that and not kick anything else. I'm just going to stop kicking things when I'm mad. Because eventually that will lead me to hurt somebody else, right? Eventually that will lead me to think I always need an outlet for my sin. No, you need to just stop sin in your life. How do you do that? I agree with God it's sinful. I repent. I change my mind on it. I take on the mind of Christ. And then I begin to live like Christ lived. It's supernatural. We try to make it a fleshly thing. Well, I'm just, I'm just going to stop beating my wife. But you know, she makes me mad and it makes me beat her again. And it's like, now, this is facetious, by the way. You know that, right? This is on tape. I should be careful of the things I use. <clears throat> Whatever your sin is, we're like, I'm going to stop that. Well, by your flesh, you really can't. And how do we know that? I'll tell you what, we work with we work with uh, people sometimes that have addiction and alcoholism in their past. And they'll tell you, I went to treatment four times, but I wasn't serious about it. So it didn't work. But then I got before the Lord and I said, Lord, I don't want this in my life anymore. And God gave me the strength. And that time I went through treatment. Then I went through after treatment. I'm telling you now, I've been four years sober. Exact same treatment program. Why didn't it work? Because I really didn't want it. I was comfortable with my drug or alcohol usage or whatever, whatever the addiction. When we get serious about it, then God gets serious about it and he says, I'm going to cooperate with you in this process and where you're weak, I'll be strong. And when we recognize that and take his strength, that's when that supernatural thing comes and we're able to avoid all those pitfalls. Are we going to be perfect? No, we're going to make mistakes. But as I said, you go one step forward and one step back, next thing, go, go forward again. Just keep taking that step. David wasn't perfect. Made some pretty big mistakes. Should have had life in prison if he was in the culture today for sleeping with a woman and murdering her husband and then, you know, all that stuff. 
sleeping with a woman that wasn't his wife, and then he murdered her husband. But, and the Bible says he was a man after God's own heart. How did that happen? Just read Psalm 51. Okay. There's some scriptures on here. Uh, uh, Psalm 51, 4 through 10. Psalm 109, 21 through 22 uh, talks about awareness of guilt. That's, that's, that's that repentance, or that, that repentance says, well, I'm, I'm kind of sorry. So I'm aware that I'm guilty. I'm aware that I'm sinning. And uh, you can read those on the Bible app. Uh, if you need some notes, I got them down here. Um, and then the Psalm 51, 1 and Psalm 134 talking about, uh, I'm aware of my sin, but then I take hold of the mercy of God. I actually reach out to God. God have mercy upon me. And then Psalm 119, 28, Job 42, 5, and 2 Corinthians 7, 10 talk about, now I'm aware of my sin. I'm trying to take hold of God's mercy. Now I'm going to change my attitude and my actions with his power, with his, with his power flowing through me. I'm going to correct those mistakes and start changing my behavior. And then finally, uh, 2 Timothy 2, 19 through 22, 1 Peter 1, 16. The result of confession and repentance, of breakthrough and follow through, is the radical and persistent pursuit of holy living and walking in obedience to God's word. There is a beauty to being obedient and walking in his word. There is a strength that you have when you are obedient to God and walking in his word. I'm telling you, you can move mountains with that strength. I thought about my ways and turned my steps back to your decrees. <clears throat> when I get weary, when I struggle with making good choices, when I am seeing things just aren't flowing right in my life, you know what I always recognize is I have shortened my quiet time with the Lord. Or I've made it about studying for a sermon instead of just really getting into fellowship with God. A couple of weeks ago, I realized that I was spending most of my quiet time preparing for things. I had a really huge busy schedule for a couple of weeks ago, and I had a lot of stuff to prepare for. And I noticed that I was preparing for ministry, but I wasn't preparing my heart as much. And so I did what I always do. I went back to the Psalms and the Proverbs. I have this thing that nothing will align my heart like just getting into the Psalms. I'll read a Psalm a day and uh, I'll read a proverb a day. And usually what happens is, uh, well, excuse me, I'll read a chapter of Proverbs. But usually what happens is, is when I get into that Psalm, I'll get stuck on a line. And it might take me two or three days to read a whole Psalm. Or... I might read a psalm and go, that was so good. I'm going to read that next one. I might read five of them. It just depends. What happens is, is I begin to just let the word nourish me. And you know what happens? It builds this strength within us where we're no longer like trying to self-examine, but we've opened our heart to God and say, God, I just want your word to reign in my life. And all of a sudden, I don't have to prepare so hard for ministry because it's, it's just the overflow of my relationship. I don't mean this to sound arrogant, but I could come up here every Sunday without having studied and I could preach the word and have a sermon that looks just like the one I had from notes. And the reason for that is, is I, I, and again, I'm not holding myself up as this perfect guy. I still struggle with everything that everybody else struggles with. But I'm saying because of this pattern, I have learned to confess and repent and to seek that fellowship. I'm just telling you, his word flows out of me. Sometimes I'll say, somebody will say something and I'll go, well, you know, that uh, God answers that in, in this scripture, or that scripture, and this here and that. And they'll go, 
How'd you know that? I go, well, I just want to tell you, okay, I I didn't memorize the entire word. I I haven't memorized Genesis to Revelation, but his word is in me. And because his word is in me, my goal is, is that what comes out of me is what I put into me. So if I'm watching John Wayne too much, what comes out of me is I'm going to draw my gun on you. (laughs) But if I'm spending more time in the word, what comes out of me is the love of Jesus. I know, I know we all love John Wayne. But I got to tell you, he wasn't that great of a guy. (laughs) He had some issues in his life. And we've set him up. I know Charlie Daniels sang a song one time. He said, I wish John Wayne would have lived to run for president. You know what? That, not, that wouldn't have been such a great thing. You know, Reagan was one thing. He was a pretty good guy. But, uh, you know, just because you're a, a, a white hat cowboy doesn't mean you'll be a good president. And uh, I'm telling you what, we can't set up people to be our God. We've got to set God in that place. So we've got to just, just, just set our mind to say, I'm going to follow him. I'm not even going to follow my favorite preacher. I'll listen to preachers, but I don't predominantly listen to sermons and things. I mean, if if you send me something on Facebook message and it's a video, I'm just telling you, I get so many of those. I don't watch any of them. And you know why I don't do that? Because I want this in me. I don't want what somebody else says in me, even though I love some of those people. There are, there are preachers that I like to listen to, but I purposely don't listen to a lot of other people because I want to hear the voice of God. And what happens is when I am intent on listening to the voice of God, <laughs> this is what I want going into my head. See, I, I don't want, whoever your favorite preacher is, I just, I just typically don't listen to those because I want the word going into me. So I listen to Jesus. That's not to say I don't sometimes check things and make sure that what I'm teaching is correct with, with that, but predominantly it's with the Holy Spirit. It's because of that fellowship thing, that fellowship thing with God, that fellowship with his Holy Spirit. I'm telling you, it will solve every problem in your life. Doesn't mean there won't be consequences to your behavior. Rusty Boroff was a thief and a drug addict and he got caught and he went to prison and he accepted Jesus, but he still had to finish his sentence. And now he runs the 180 program and he's changing lives like crazy through, through the word. Todd White, probably the most famous evangelist with dreadlocks at least, <clears throat> was in prison when he met Jesus and he had to finish his sentence before he came out and became the most famous dreadlock evangelist in the world. My friend, uh, Pat Vandenberg up in Freeport, he was here for the last hope has come, gave his testimony, was a drug enforcer in California, beating people up, accidentally shot his best friend accidentally killed his girlfriend by drunk driving, went to prison, met Jesus, had to finish his sentence before he came out. Now, he's tearing up Freeport for Jesus. He's now apostolically going over to, is it Kenya? And he, uh, the Father's House Church uh, in Freeport now is uh, apostolically planting churches in Kenya. but he had to finish his consequences before he could do the work of God. Our sin will bring consequences. God will forget the sin and he'll deal with us and use us in spite of those consequences. That's called fellowship with God. He can deal with our consequences without condemning us for our sin. If we've confessed, repented, and and cleaned it up, He will deal with those consequences. He'll say, I'll let you live through the consequence, but I'll give you some power and some anointing through that, and you'll be changing lives even while you're in prison, whether it's physical prison or just a spiritual bondage you have. Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for this this 
this relationship that you are just crying out to us to accept. And that's one of just confession, repentance, and then turning back to you. Father, help us in our lives to do that. We trust you that you can take care of that sin issue. We trust you that even if we have to live through consequences, that you use us in spite of ourselves. We don't have to be perfect to be used by you. We just have to be on that journey. And so, Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for uh, the people of God. I thank you that you love us and that you want us forgiven for your sake, not just our sake. So we trust you for that in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.